so now you know uh, now that we're talking about you know gold we're talking about silver and we're talking about mostly physical possession of taking physical possession of these uh, of these metals rather than the ETFs and let me explain I'll, we're going to go now into why I suggest you stay away from the ETFs so let's go into uh, ETFs specifically I'm going to be focusing on GLD now when you invest in precious precious metals you have a little, you have you have many things to consider regarding your own goals and objectives many view metals as insurance against government or financial system collapse others view it as a capital investment within their larger portfolios but no matter how you view the metals there's one important factor you must consider no matter for what purpose you choose to invest in precious metals. That is assurance of maintaining the value of your investment, which is apart from the market risks one accepts when entering into any investment. When deciding upon your investment vehicle, you've got many choices. One can invest in metal bars, metal coins, collectible metal coins, metal ETFs, or even options on metal ETFs. While there are benefits and drawbacks to each of these vehicles, the purpose of the presentation, this part of the presentation tonight, is to highlight the serious dangers involved if your investment vehicle of choice is a metal ETF, or even worse, options on those ETFs. You probably may not know that I'm an attorney by training, so while I'm able to understand the inherent risks in these ETFs, there are further risks represented by contractual relationships inherent in these ETFs as well. And I'm going to touch upon uh, both of these types of risks this evening, but clearly I can't offer you a full legal treatise on the pitfalls inherent in these vehicles. But I'm hoping to give you at least some taste as to how toxic these funds are and should not be seriously considered as long-term investment vehicles. So let's look at the risks involved in the ETFs themselves before we even enter into discussion of the contractual risks you need to understand. After reading the prospectus, there are four main categories of issues I've seen with the GLD. And these are the four as you can see. So first, let's look at uh, the risk factor section of the, gold, of the GLD prospectus. Specifically, the first section I'd like to highlight states. Neither the trustee nor the custodian independently confirms the, fi the fineness of the gold allocated to the trust in connection with the creation of a basket insurance issuances. The prospectus goes on to further state, in issuing baskets, the trustee relies on certain information received from the custodian, which is subject to confirmation after the trustee has relied on the information. If such information turns out to be incorrect, baskets may be issued in exchange for an amount of gold which is more or less the amount of gold which is required to be, to be deposited with the trust. Now these two sections should be alarming to anyone who actually takes their investments seriously. These are basically disclaimers by the trustee regarding the quality or even the amount of gold being held in trust for the ETF. Furthermore, it doesn't seem as though the trustee has a specific obligation to confirm the gold deposited in the trust actually exists. Rather, the trustee is permitted to rely upon information given to it. Again, please note there is no absolute legal requirement which I've, in, which I've seen incumbent upon the trustee to ensure that there is sufficient gold in the trust as represented by the amount of shares sold in the ETF. To make matters even more tenuous for holders of shares in the GLD, the, the prospectus further states that, I'll give you a moment to read that, Now, what, what all this is saying is that not only does the trustee have no obligation to ensure that there is a sufficient amount of gold within the trust, even if it wanted to do so, its ability is further limited by the contractual relationship it has entered into with its custodian within the custod custody agreement. Furthermore, if there is a sub-custodian sub holding gold for the trust, the trustee has no right to ensure the existence and accuracy of the gold reported and held by such sub-custodian. This truly blew my mind when I read this. Forget about even requiring an audit, which it clearly does not. The trustee cannot even step onto the premises of a sub-custodian or even review the records of a sub-custodian. Now let's assume gold begins to rally like I showed you our expectations are over the next you know, 10 to 20 years. Um, and you know, we're going to 2,500, which is a 
bare minimum of what I'm expecting over the next several years and well beyond. Now, most holders of the GLD would be quite happy to see the rise in the prices of gold and will assume their investment in the GLD is increasing their net worth. But what happens if it comes to light that there are issues with the quality or amount of the gold being held in trust by a custodian or subcustodian? The trustee will now be scrambling to attempt to find a potentially significant amount of gold to satisfy the needed requirements for the trust holdings. The question then becomes how the trustee will be able to acquire the needed gold to satisfy the trust needs. And in the event it is unable to do so, then the trust runs a significant risk of default, especially if gold has gone into a parabolic phase for whatever reason. One has to ask themselves, is it not during those parabolic runs in gold that one truly wants to have assurance of the safety of their investment and not be concerned that the fund in which they have invested may be short the amount of gold to which they believe they've invested? There could be a myriad number of reasons as to why gold would enter into a parabolic rise. So would you not want to have assurance that you actually own the gold for which you have transferred your hard-earned money to supposedly acquire? So let's move on to the next major issue with the GLD, which is that it is a vehicle designed to lose a minimum amount of value even if the price is rising. I'll give you a moment to read that. And then – and please take note of the bold. So, I mean, I, I'm not sure – if you're reading this, I really don't have to repeat what the prospectus is saying here. They're telling you directly that the fund is designed to lose value even if the market for gold rises. Now, if the preceding risks and, guar and guaranteed loss of value are not bad enough, let's look at some of the other sections in the prospectus which highlight further risks to owners of these ETFs. The prospectus clearly states that the trust does not insure its gold. Yes, you read that right. The trust does not insure its gold. It further goes on to state, if the trust gold is lost, damaged, stolen, or destroyed under circumstances rendering a party liable to the trustee, to the trust, the responsible party may not have the financial resources sufficient to satisfy the trust's claim. So the prospectus is clearly warning you, it is clearly warning you that there is no entity nor is there any insurance backing potential risk of loss to the physical gold on hand. And yes, folks, it can get worse. There are further counterparty risks that make this investment vehicle even less appealing to own as an investment. And a highlighted section again, if the custodian becomes insolvent, its assets may not be adequate to satisfy a claim by the trust or any authorized participant. So if a custodian or sub-custodian holding the gold becomes insolvent, and since the gold they hold is not specifically designated for the GLD trust account, all the gold they possess will be used to satisfy all the debts of that custodian and not just the debt owed to the GLD trust. So this now brings me to the discussion of what happens in the event of the fault of the custodian or the ETF itself. Well, in the event of the fault of the trust itself in which the gold is held, one becomes an unsecured creditor of the trust. That means the trust will likely be required to liquidate its positions in the metals and satisfy the unsecured obligations of the trust, usually at pennies on the dollar. None of the gold being held in trust within the GLD is designated to each holder of shares on an individual basis. That means that the shares you own in the GLD does not have specific gold that is designated to you as the owner of those particular shares. Therefore, all the owners of the gold, of the GLD, have equal rights to all the gold being held in trust or whatever is left. So if there is not sufficient gold to satisfy all rights to that collective gold, all the owners are subject to only a pro rata share. In other words, their pro rata share gets reduced in, from their ownership 
interest in the total gold being actually held and on hand. Now, when you invest in gold, don't you want to assure yourself of having an asset which retains some amount of value, especially when you consider where gold potentially is headed over the next 10 to even 30 years from now? Now, when you place money into these ETFs, not only is one not protected in the manner in which they initially expected when investing in metals, as they have no ownership in the actual gold itself, but one is now in an even worse off position, since the amount of money they invested may only be returned to them at pennies on the dollar in the event of a default. To make matters worse, if one invests in options on these ETFs, then you are even one step further removed in the line of unsecured creditors than even the owners of the ETFs themselves. An option is a contract upon the ETF. So the primary stakeholders are the ETF owners, whereas the owners of the options on the ETFs would stand in line behind the ETF owners in the event of default. The chances of an option holder being given anything are so far remote, you probably have a better chance of winning the lotto. Therefore, in the event of a default, the chances of an option holder to actually be made close to hold on, the, in, on their investment is close to nil. Now, it's quite unfortunate that most of those that buy shares of the GLD believe that they have an ownership in a gold investment vehicle, which is assumed to be a safe alternative to actually owning the gold itself. I seriously hope that this presentation has at least brought to light that this is far from the truth. Personally, I only view the GLD and SLV as trading vehicles and would never ever have more than 1 to 3% of the total amount I have designated for investment into metals placed into these tenuous vehicles. Now that concludes my presentation. I had to move it through a little quicker than I initially expected. And uh, if there are any questions, I will gladly take them. If not, I will wish everybody a good evening. Abby, hi. Thank you so much for that presentation. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Of course. There are no questions at this time, so um, we'll go ahead and, and close the session down. Thank you so, so much.